we've heard some fascinating stories of organizations that have gone through a lot of transition. Um, it's been from the notion of delivering purpose, we heard this morning, the airline industry and the resilience that has shown the concept of control tower, and most recently the exponential growth that Moderna's been experiencing over the last few years. For this discussion though, what I'd like to do is personalize it a bit. I've told my panel that there's 700 GBS leaders in our audience today. So to drive that infrastructural and institutional change, there requires leadership and requires certain capabilities at a leadership level. So that's going to be the topic we're going to talk about in our panel. But before I get underway, maybe introductions, <coughs> Richard? Thank you. Yes, uh, Richard Cornish, Chief Executive of Defence Business Services, part of the UK Ministry uh, of Defence. Uh, we provide fairly typical shared services, uh, as, as many others will, but also some quite unique things given the nature of what we do. So uh, we will have some quite diverse things, including a care home, uh, for example. Uh, we deliver in-house, uh, but we also have part of the uh, organisation is outsourced. Uh, uh, but also, I just wanted one moment to reflect on something that's made me really proud this week, uh, if, if people may indulge, given the uh, events in the UK in the last couple of weeks. and. Uh, how on earth am I making a link to a state funeral and shared services? But one of the things that really uh, made me uh, proud of the team, and I know many of the team that were involved, is uh, providing shared services to the military personnel, uh, all those thousands that were taking part in the uh, state funeral uh, on Monday. You, you don't see some of those things because it's payroll, expenses, all those kind of things. But the one thing that we also provide are medals. Uh, in our shared services. So those thousands of uh, people taking part in the ceremony, uh, it was just a really tiny element of the proceedings and everyone's support, but it was really proud for my team to know that they played a really small part in uh, that ceremonial uh, event for those thousands of serving personnel. I mean, I think that resonates with our theme of being consciously human. Um, that's amazing. Um, Deborah? Deborah. There are three things you need to know about me um, in the context of this conversation today. Number one, I, if there was a three-sided blanket, I would have been on all three sides. I've been an advisor, I've been a service provider, and I had a couple of stints in enterprise. Second, according to Panit Bhatia of Deloitte, and we always know Deloitte is always right, I'm the <laughs> oldest person in this industry. <laughs> Someone has to be the comic. And third, um, I'm going to tell you something that most people don't say on a plenary stage, but in my last gig as a GBS leader, I was the wrong leader. I can't say that I failed, but I can tell you that my stakeholders were not aligned. I can tell you that my team did not have the right capability. And last but not least, I can tell you that my service provider lo lost a boatload of money. And as a result of these learnings, I spent the last 10 years or so focusing on GBS and talent. Like previous speakers today, I believe that talent is the key to unlocking success. And I spend time looking at um, operating models in light of talent, org design, and talent acquisition. So thank you for having me. That's amazing. I think we've got a lot of different roles that you could be covering off in this panel. Um, Sunny, a long trip from uh, Singapore for you? Yeah, absolutely. So I work for BHP, the world's largest mining and resources organisation. Um, I've had roles uh, running the revenue line for some of our commodities. Um, I've run our global supply chain as the Chief Procurement Officer. And I think these roles really gave me this sense of the felt experience of our frontline operations. You know, the people at our mines. You know, when you think about them, you've got to think about a maintainer trying to get a truck back out into the field but not having the part or having the wrong part. You've got to think about a superintendent that's staring at a truck parked up, not moving dirt because they don't have an operator. And then I get super excited about this job in GBS because we touch the very value chain that supports that frontline productivity. And so at uh, BHP, we're doing all the things to transform that. We've moved from that traditionally siloed um, shared services function where we've brought it all under one aggregated roof with a single reporting line. We're, of course, scaling that out to more complex services. 
Um, but what I really love is that capability that we're deploying to connect those processes, to remove the waste from them, and then actually have a real EBIT outcome for our front line. So That's super amazing. exciting times for us. That's amazing, and, and a lot of years at BHP yourself. Anil? Right, uh, my name is Anil Yadav. I lead the uh, global business services for Royal Philips. Uh, now, let me just use 30 seconds to tell everybody what Philips does, because a lot of people think we're still into lighting and making transistors. <laughs> uh, but we, we have come a long way. It's a 130 years old company, and uh, we are 80% plus now in healthcare. So all the big uh, CT scanners, MRIs, ultrasounds, uh, this is what we deal with. Still nimble, still uh, you know, an agile company. We started our GBS journey five, six years back now, and we rapidly grew. So we are close to 7,000 plus people globally now, uh, present across, across the continents. And we are pretty much through HR, finance, supply chain procurement, master data, analytics, project management, you, you name it and we do it. I, I think the biggest thing which we are looking forward to is to really taking it to the next level. And a lot of people are challenging that, saying that after growing to this size, can you take it to the next level? And there is a next level. So we already started, like we were talking, right, standardization, automation, uh, rationalization. And now we are looking really end-to-end -end and making it a center model. So what we were sharing in the start today about the center model strategy, that resonates very well because that's the direction which we are heading towards. So really exciting times ahead. Excellent. That sounds like the center office model to, uh, to us as well. Um, so, so Deborah, I'm going to start with you. I mean, you've made a very provocative uh, statement. It's very rare that people come on the stage and say, hey, I was the wrong person for the, for, for the job. Tell me more, I mean, because we want to personalize this conversation around leadership styles and the right leadership models that are appropriate and think in terms of sort of where that example came from and sort of like how you were applying the wrong kind of person. your... Yes. Yeah, I got seduced into a job. I worked for an investment bank. Um, I, my background is financial services and I wasn't smart enough to understand that a commercial bank and an investment bank had very different cultures. I was aligned with the commercial bank because there was a line of sight to the customer. And investment bankers, I just didn't get them, to be very honest. I didn't get the industry. So I had the wrong affinity for the industry. I probably had the wrong capability as well. I came from an organization that was highly collegial. I knew how to work in a collegial organization. I didn't know how to work in a um, very hierarchical organization, to be very honest, uh, where money was the most important thing. Not that commercial banks don't think about money. I didn't have the right capability in terms of um, the, the problem I had to solve was probably more technologically focused than I had the capability to deal with. So I didn't see those things. And last but not least, I came from a position where I thought GBS was about telling and not about listening. So I can't say that I was an abject failure, but I can say that I was less successful than I should have been for myself and also for the organization. Richard, I mean, your, your, your background, and, and did the, how did that set you up uh, for success in your, in your current role? Yeah, so I think my background's uh, in government delivery uh, in various roles, and I think one of my earliest uh, leadership lessons was thinking that a sea of green uh, on a scorecard was success. Um, and someone very quickly told me, they said, you know, you can hit the, uh, the target, but you'll miss the point. Uh, and that kind of advice has stuck with me throughout my career. And when, when we ever talk about performance, and of course performance is important, uh, talking about what we're doing, understanding the metrics, et cetera, is important. But actually, what does it mean at the end of it for people uh, and for the workforce? So trying to take a much more rounded approach is something I've kind of learned over the years so that we're never just hitting the target uh, and we're always kind of getting what the point of those services are. And you know, in my early stages, I definitely didn't do that. I thought hitting the target was a good thing. Got it, got it, got it. I mean, you came from the uh, industry. Uh, I mean, you were in the company for a few years. Sunny, how did that help you in terms of the transition to uh, your recent role? And I think you just got into the role 18 months, 18 two months years ago. Yeah. I think, actually, Richard, what you said really resonates with me. I, you know, I could see um, a GBS organization having a completely green scorecard, but the actual business outcome is not moving. And I think that's what GBS leaders really need to bring to the table, is a relentless pursuit of 
the business outcome. And therefore, we have to be very conscious to be prioritising the, the end-to-end -end outcome, not, not the subcomponents, but actually what is actually happening on our front lines and bring that right into the GBS, bring that to our, um, our people and bring our customer right close to us to, to deliver. And I think that's, for me, absolutely core in what we deliver. The, the componentry, the, 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 the mechanisms, the technology, the methodologies, we can build those, right? But the relentless pursuit of perfection for your customer, that's a, that's a, that's a culture. And, and Anil, as you said, people think of Philips as lighting and, and not necessarily healthcare. I mean, that industry um, knowledge and industry understanding in your leadership team, how did you kind of instill that? So um, this is a very you know, interesting as well as important point, Parag. You know, I will answer the question a little differently. So I, I have been a career GBS person, so which means I spent 20 plus years with five different companies. And uh, like Deborah, I always felt that I know the things, so I need to tell the organization and they hire me for this capability. But sooner in, uh, in, in my, you know, all, or let's say last two organizations and more in Philips also, I realized that I bring capability, but I don't understand the organization. So the biggest skill which uh, I need to develop in myself is the learning agility. How fast I can learn about the company culture, business, and then make a relevant uh, GBS uh, for the organization. So I think that changed the game, and now when I'm trying to build the leadership or, you know, let's say the middle management, I think that's the key, you know, for people to understand what the primary business which we are in. We make, may, we make it a point, everybody goes to the factory, they understand what the supply chain is, what are the components are, uh, because we manage a, a big part of the supply chain in GBS, including, you know, we are tracking the shipments, we are looking at logistic partners, uh, the last mile suppliers, and in, eventually putting up these uh, big uh, CT scan and MRIs in the hospitals. So we are sending people to really to the field, to the factories, to the hospitals, to observe and understand the impact of it, and, and that's changing, and that's making a big change. The second point I think, uh, like Sunny spoke about, right, we, we're already looking at end-to-end -end metric. We're not looking at GBS metric. There is nothing like a GBS metric. Mm -hmm. There is a business metric, and we all contribute to the business metric. Uh, you can look at subset of where you're going to make an improvement, but there is only one metric to look at, like uh, we, which you call it all time in full, right? I mean, whether you fulfilled a customer expectation, it's a six month journey. If you did that, then you all are ticked green. If not, then go back to the drawing board and start reinventing the process because it's not working. So, so the days of what process SLA dashboards are, are, are kind of gone, is that what we're hearing? I think they're still there, um, and, and it's really important to have that data, but it's about what the data prompts you to have in terms of the conversation. So understanding what it's telling you, what does the experience feel like on the ground for an end user, um, is the kind of conversation to go after rather than just to talk about the metric on its own. Got it. So we had Moderna speak. Um, obviously, uh, the pandemic has impacted uh, the entire world, um, and uh, I would say if there ever was a silver lining, I mean, in this whole last few years, GBS leaders have, been an, have, have had an opportunity to really shine, I would think, um, through the pandemic in terms of keeping core operations running, um, in terms of being on that hot speed dial button from the executive office to make sure things are, are operating on time. I would happen to be in India, um, and clearly a lot of essential services were being run from there. Talk to me a bit about kind of your role and what are the types of um, attributes and capabilities that allowed you and your organizations to be resilient over the last kind of couple of years? Um, maybe I'll talk with Sunny. Sure. So I think, I think well, let me split that up into two. I, I think for, for us as GBS leaders then, I think I would describe there's got to be a level of systems thinking. You have to, you have to find the role of your GBS organisation and its operating model in the context of your organisation, and you've got to be able to create the conditions for that to thrive. So I think as GBS leaders, we have to be, and it goes to a little bit, Neil, what you said, right? You find what's the right model for you, how does that fit into the context and culture of your organisation, and you've got to be able to adapt and, and, and bring the conditions for your organisation to thrive. But when that flows to your people, right, in, this, in, in today's world, 
you know, we want a vivid and dynamic working environment where people do not back office work, but they solve problems. And I think that was what was really important for us, right, as the complexity of work moved. What did, what did you guys do in your leadership team to really get, instill that, that feeling within your, within your population, your talent pool? So we're doing a few things. I think the first thing is we're bringing the customer closer as much as possible to our teams. We're connecting it, we're embedding our teams with our customer, we're creating joint routines with our customer. Our customers are coming to see our performance board and saying, hey, why are you even measuring that? I don't care, right? You need to measure this outcome and help me deliver this outcome, right? And our teams drive towards that. And then we're giving them the, the skills to solve problems once. Root cause analysis, right? All those kind of lean, um, based methodologies that ensure that they're consistently improving their work every day from a baseline. Now, if you get that motivated across thousands of people, right, that transformative capacity on that end-to-end -end chain is unstoppable. De Deborah, last couple of years, I mean, um, I know we've talked about that providing a platform for GBS leaders to really shine. Um, what's been your experience in visiting and connecting with many of these GBS leaders over the last couple of years? Well, I, th the, the, I still believe that COVID was a blessing for GBS because it, it gave it legitimacy. And I think we've had previous conversations. I'm not sure that GBS has a seat at the table, but it's now legitimate. There's no daily scrapping to be able to stay, um, stay afloat as a, as a business model. But... I think where the, I've seen growth in GBS organizations as a result of the pandemic goes back to something that you've said, which is really GBS organizations that have learned how to align with the business. And alignment is not the same as agreeing with the business. Yep. It's not the same as acceding to the business, but align with business. I think the models learned how to align a lot better than it, than it did previously. I think there's less tell, there's more listen, there's more collaboration with the business, there's more working together with the business. The challenge is teaching the capabilities that support alignment in the rest of the, in the, rest, in the organization. I think that's really key. It's a, it's a talent challenged industry, I think, as, as Christoph said earlier. Got it. Anil, does that resonate in terms of just aligning with the business, I mean, and, and building out that leadership team? Yeah, we have big time, actually. Uh, you know, before, before the pandemic, the GBS, when, whenever you were setting up or moving the roles to the hubs, there was always a question mark of how the relationship will work, how this whole thing will work. But I think this is, uh, you know, uh, post-pandemic, now, organizations are really looking at, you know, what you call it, the future of work, that can you be from anywhere or can you work out of anywhere? This kind of a concept was very well tested in GBS, and most of the organization, GBS is passing it on to the bigger company. For example, one of the things which we did, uh, and we were doing very strongly and became even more stronger, is daily management. Uh, I, I think anybody in operation would be familiar with. It's a continuous improvement concept where you look at a, at a dashboard in 15 minutes and try to look at the health of the operations. Now, uh, this was always part of the GBS, but because of the pandemic in the last two years, we made it a company-wide initiative. So everybody looks at, a, at the DM, and the DMs have become completely cross-functional. So it's not just a GBS team is sitting in that. There could be a complete supply chain, you know, uh, the marketing teams and the market also sitting so that you end-to-end -end looking at where the bottlenecks and, and you're solving digitally. Now, this was not possible three years back, but now it is possible. So the adoption to the, innova you know, the innovative technologies or the GBS ways of working are actually becoming a bigger norm uh, across the organizations. Got it, got it. Richard? And I, and I think there's a chance to uh, make it much more transparent. And I think COVID helped because of the focus on kind of some of those key services. But I think sometimes uh, GBS, we can be slightly hesitant about, well, why do you want to know that bit of information and, and get slightly defensive? And I think if we can just be more open and transparent with all of our kind of key organizational customers, it helps build the trust, it helps build um, uh, the sense of what you can deliver and how you're delivering it and, and just establishes a much more mature relationship, I think. Let me create some problem for you, Parai. Sure, you're creating problems so, for me? Yeah, so, okay. so I actually think that part of our role is to create tension in the organization as well. 
Um, and you have to have the resilience. Yeah, you've got to create, create you've got to create an organisational dilemma. Yeah. Because the more that a GBS grows and expands its capability, the more it pushes the rest of the organisation to a higher purpose, right? to a higher capability itself. And so you're constantly creating a rub in the organisation that as your capabilities grow, as you're able to deliver those business outcomes, as you're able to give service back, well, what do the others do? Well, they then have to go and do something else, right? And you have to keep pushing them. That causes tension. And you want your organisation to have that tension, not just that sense of harmony. So, so how many of you have been accused of building out your GBS kingdoms? Is that a, is that a catchphrase? <laughs> yes, all the time. Uh, I, I think it's a, like, like he said, right? I mean, it's a healthy tension. But at the same time, it is also, you know, the organizations were always built like that, and now GBS is, seems like a new component. But I would say this is the, the division of work in the right spirit, right? Because there is a lot of, you know, things needs to happen at the background to make the product go to the customer. Now, if that all can be centralized, you know, you can use the latest technology and you can innovate much more faster, then why as a company you should not do that, right? I think this is becoming more and more clearer and that is where the empowerment is working. Obviously, there is a tension because this is not the model and it's fundamentally changing yeah. the organization divided into compartments. Uh, but I think if it's played well, in the next five to 10 years, this will become a norm and GBS will be an essential part of the design when you design a new organization rather than an evolution. Yeah, but I, I think one of the challenges here is that in order to push a GBS model from a leadership standpoint, you have to meet the organization where it is. Mm -hmm. And some GBS organizations, still its efficiency and effectiveness is still cost. The, ch the opportunity happens when the organization sees GBS as so much more. But understanding where, what the organization's construct is something that is a piece of very vital information because that's what allows you to change. Well, that's a healthy tension mm -hmm. as well. Does it make, make sense in terms of the tension? Yeah, I mean, slightly probably different perspective in, in uh, providing uh, services in the public sector. But I think, you know, what I think you need to also be really clear on is what are your capabilities? You know, there will be some things, you know, in my organization we may not think we could grow into because we don't have the right capabilities. There'll be other things that you definitely can. But I think the other thing that's really important on that journey is explaining the why and the what. And if you can explain the opportunity that there is uh, out there and the way that could improve things, then it will, it will make it a lot easier. But you're always going to have competing views, uh, I guess, from functions, from some of the customers in the, uh, the wider organization. So it's about being really clear what your USP is, the value you can add, uh, I think. Got it. I'm, I'm going to pivot a bit now. I mean, it's difficult not to address the, the topic of talent, and, and there's leadership, but then the role that you all play in, in building out your team, right? And these are large teams, highly leveraged, Obviously, we've read, read about a lot about the uh, attrition levels and, and, and talent pools. Any stories and specifics that you've taken to really address that topic, especially over the last couple of, couple of years where there's been a huge increasing war on talent, I would say? Maybe Sunny, let's just start. Um, this is actually quite a complex one because it obviously can cover a lot of ground. But I, I, think, I think the exciting thing for us to bring talent in is to create an organization that is pushing the boundaries on the nature of the work it does. Um, so if you are processing and, tran and, and, and transacting, in the world of talent today, I'm not sure you're going to get there to be, be what you want to be. If you want to offer those services back and that value add back and remove waste out of processes and deliver business outcomes, you've got to actually entice people with the nature of their work. And I think the the attraction for the, the way we're thinking about attraction is actually, as I said before, trying to attract problem solvers, people that want to experiment, people that want to incubate ideas, right, and then have them, have them played back with their customers. And I think if you create those conditions for people to truly um, play with their work, improve it every day, that becomes an exciting job. I'm not just doing, right? Um, and so that creates a culture um, that brings in um, Brings in the talent. Anil, I mean, I... yeah. So we, we 
we are looking at two pronged approach, right? One is when we are trying to get the talent from the market, we're just not getting for the capabilities now. We're also getting for the domains. Let's say you, you want a supply chain focused person and may or may not have a GBS experience because we believe at a certain maturity, you know how to run the business as a GBS, but you don't have the core capabilities of, let's say, supply chain, for example, or procurement. So I think the focus has shifted again to balance capability versus function. The second is I think even a bigger drive which we're doing is to really get talent internally in the company. Yeah. Because yeah. we don't want to become a compartment or a separate part of the organization. So we are running actually a structured program of onboarding leaders which are coming from, let's say, the larger company and become a GBS leader uh, you, you must have heard about such kind of programs run reversely, most of the organizations, yeah. but we are doing that so that we can get integrated more. And the more we get integrated, it's easier to offer a wider career path and GBS becomes an entry point for a lot of people. So I think that way it is working. It's still very early days. We, are, we have designed this in the last 18 months or so, but we, we think the integration is the future rather than separation as a GBS. Yeah. So now I think there's a, there's a point there because I've looked at GBS organizations and I've identified 12 to 16 roles that really make a GBS work. I call them make it happen roles. And some should always come from the inside and you can train them up or you can equip them with capabilities. Some should come up from the outside to create that tension that you've talked about. And, and a good GBS leader understands how to manipulate that. Who's from the inside? Who's from the outside? What capabilities complement each other? I don't think we do enough of that. So it's not one size fits all. No. But I mean, resonates with what I guess Angela talked about in the morning, what you're not supporting the business. You are the business, fundamentally, right? I mean, um, are, are you recruiting primarily from within public sector? Or, or how, how does your talent model work? Well, we'll take anyone from anywhere uh, if we can get them, <laughs> if they've got the right skills. But obviously, we can't compete on pay. So, you know, we have to talk about the kind of wider benefit uh, package. And I think one of the things that certainly in somewhere like defense, but it's the same for some of the other government departments, is being able to uh, connect the wider mission of the organization and what we might be delivering for the public and seeing that you know, the GBS roles are playing a really important, if not high profile, part of that journey. But I think um, picking up on some of the other comments, I think moving from other professions is really key as well. So, so for instance, I've just taken on the head of profession role in MOD for um, operational delivery, uh, which is a profession across the UK civil service, the biggest kind of profession um, in the civil service. And I think you know, there's tens, several hundreds of thousands of people in that profession in, in the civil service already. And that's an untapped kind of market probably for GBS, certainly uh, for defense. So yeah, looking at kind of other parts of government, looking at external, uh, and trying to kind of find different routes, because actually mm -hmm. you know, different routes are going to suit different roles, aren't they? But you're, you're right, there's kind of a life cycle to GBS. There's a time to bring in people from the outside, and there's a time to bring in loyalists who understand the secret handshake, and being able to balance, given the evolution of the organization, it's pretty important. Yeah. I think it's got to go the other way as well, Parag, like in the sense of um, I'm getting excited by, as I start to have conversations and realize the scale of our organization, we've got talent pools in places that people don't have in our organization. And they're great people with yep. specialized skills. And so all of a sudden, it's giving us back, not just how do we get talent, but actually how do we help the business outcome and provide the talent right, from locations that they couldn't otherwise naturally get access to. So I think there's a... There's, an, there's another rub to it. So I'm going to ask you guys a bit of an awkward question. So your own individual personal brand, what role does that play in motivating and, and, and delivering kind of the, the talent agenda? You're looking at me. I'll, I'll start with that. I'll give you some time to think. No problem. I thought you were looking at me. Uh, so can you repeat it again? You so you're a personal brand. I mean, you know, you've got hundreds, thousands of people, and you're the, the GBS lead. What role does the personal brand of the GBS leader play in building that whole talent equation? Big time. I, I, I think it's a, you know, and that is where I, I think personally my role has evolved, being in the organization for, let's say, four years now. Uh, the first few initial years were more around building the team, building the capability, selling the concept, making it a part of the organization. 
but then it has all become right what is the vision and you know its vision is not just written on a slide which you need to you know read in town halls and meetings to meetings or you know socialize i think walking the talk and just making it real and and for me to make it happen in terms of getting that right mix of leadership so whenever there is a next opportunity now thankfully in last two years we all have been running around 20% attrition which has actually given a very good opportunity to mix this talent a lot more but uh from my role perspective i think i take almost my 30 40% of my time more focusing on what kind of capabilities i need to build and what kind of vision i need to sell so that it's very clear that we are on the right path if i start fo focusing a lot more on metrics or productivity then i think we lose the focus again and you know what is the bigger alignment so personally that is where i've seen a lot of value coming in mm. got it mm. but your comment about brand is important i fell in a couple of years ago i fell into um talent acquisition for gbs and one of the things that the candidates i work with look at first is the brand of the company you know i remember when when i was younger that i wanted to be able to tell my mother i work for a company that she heard of before i never really did that but it 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 was really important that's number 1 but number 2 the leader's brand is very important and it's not necessarily whether they're a rock star but are they a good leader and where are they going next that's becoming more and more important because people work for people we tend to forget that and the the opportunities that the leader have govern the ability to attract really strong talent. Richard, thoughts? Yeah, I mean, at risk of sounding buzzwordy, I think it's being really authentic and honest, and I'm not just saying that because they're positive words, but I think you just need to be really direct with people about what the plan is, what is the strategy. I think people want to know that there is a plan that you've shaped that as a team um and that you can explain it and you can defend it and you can go and talk to uh different customers and different functional leads so i think being uh, open and honest you know people say that but actually doing it uh, is the really important thing got it sunny i've given you some time to think about the question uh, okay yeah. uh, <laughs> so actually i think uh, if i'm honest about it i actually think my brand's a negative brand um on a negative brand a negative brand cuz i'm the sales guy right okay. and ultimately the business isn't looking for sales they're looking for outcomes and i think the brand of my team that truly delivers that felt experience is what's winning and then the nature of the the nature of the work that we then start to um incubate and grow in a, you know in our organization is what's exciting and that's building its own brand right um so outside of um our organization you know back in the enterprise they're sort of looking in and saying hey that's that's where reporting and analytics is being incubated you know that's where process mining and and transformation is happening right i want to be a part of that so i think it's about expelling and exposing all of the great things that um happen in the organization and ensuring it's connected to customer and and just more tactically i mean i guess again there's only so many hours in the day you've got leverage teams across multiple geographies any tactics any sort of tools that you can share with kind of other with the audiences how do you communicate that is it through um videos is it through like you travel a lot how do you communicate connection to purpose um and giving people that golden thread is probably one of the hardest things that I think any leader has to be able to do in their role um and you just have to relentlessly um give people that connection through your everything from your routines your town halls the symbols you use on your performance board what's up on your walls um in you know in in your office i mean we just saw the stell they had their hive you know global business solutions i remember that it's a symbol right it's there um and so those kind of examples i think will really connect with people but you've got to yeah just relentlessly pursue people's connection to purpose in everything you do and in every conversation give them the why to their work do you, do you feel like you're in a bit of a fish bowl <laughs> well I'll, i'll answer it a little differently i think it's you know authenticity has become you know the most important thing right i mean so in this generation or in the world which you're living in you, you can't make it up right you can't make good videos in you know just just say the right thing 
it's more around uh, you know giving a peek into your life and how as a leader you operate so uh, i think the transparency and authenticity in terms of how you think how you operate do you do live by those values i think that has become even more important so that is where i try to work a lot in the last two years right so how do i share more about what i'm feeling and you know this could be during the covid times so or feeling the fear or you know when the company is not doing that great then being transparent on what we need to do to make it happen or where we are i think that is getting appreciated a lot more as compared to just talking through you know what the big picture looks like so i think that's making a lot of difference uh, it's it's a personally getting out of the comfort zone right because we are not used to doing it like 10 yeah. years back but now it is right so the comms person who helps me who keeps on you know nudging me and saying that i need a family video now <laughs> to go live now <laughs> next time it is it is this comforting uh, to start with but i then i then i feel a lot more normal once i start doing that so i think that works Excellent. and I, and i think you have to uh, mix it up and keep it fresh don't you because i remember a few years ago i used to do a weekly blog uh, in the role i was in at the time and some people loved it some people hated it and uh, i think you just have to then adapt don't you and change things slightly to keep it fresh and make sure you're meeting as many uh, people's kind of requirements as possible but just one thing i i found it quite difficult i was coming into this role uh, one year into covid and all of my kind of traditional ways of kind of landing in a role would be face to face with people out in the offices spending all my time kind of walking the floor and you try and do that there's no one there um so you had to find different ways to do that and of course all of the virtual ways that we've got used to but i think it's one of the challenges we're going to have as leaders as we sort of you know now uh, continue in the hybrid world of how do we get that balance right of different methods of communication different ways of being visible uh, without necessarily always being physically visible in the organization you can't please all the people all the time you can't <laughs> well, I, I love the idea of the blog. I, I did my blog as well for five years when I was at, converted into a book as well. So, so it all worked really well. We got a few minutes left. Now I'm going to now pivot. Some of the breakouts yesterday, today. What are the signature issues that all of your organizations are dealing with? Sustainability, environment, diversity, globalization, technology, artificial intelligence. is gbs going to be a fast follower and wait for direction or is gbs going to be able to play a significant role in how the broader enterprise actually addresses uh, and copes and you know executives from moderna are saying hey this is just not if it's when the next pandemic is going to hit i i think it's going to be leader and we already are the leaders in in many other space uh see if if i talk about my company right i mean we have a 100 year plus heritage right 130 to be precise average tenure in in headquarters or let's say most of the location is 20 years now think about you know how easy or difficult it is to change there yeah. now you shift to gbs and the average tenure is 3 to 5 years average age is much more lesser the exposure to the technology is different so just by by the positioning itself uh the ability to change is much more as compared to the rest of the organization obviously i'm not taking away from experience and everything so we have seen anything which we new newly introduce in gbs it's easier easier in a sense of you try and you fail and you can move on to the next one people don't get hung up to that and if it is successful it's easy to also pass on because people don't want to clinch to that saying that this is mine uh so these are some of the learnings which we are passing on so we are also selling it internally in the organization that we can be the innovation hub where you can try uh and fail and that's okay and if something gets successful let's do it company wise like the ci example i gave you right or you know if fails then you move on to the next one so my answer is yes big time yes i think by the positioning which we have we could be the leaders in inno- innovation for our companies uh mm. oh. I'm super excited because I did not know about the GBS industry until 18 months ago, right? As and it's truly opened my eyes as an operating model and its and its potential. Um and when I think about the operating conditions that we're walking into, we got inflation, labor shortages, supply chain disruptions, right? The effectiveness of this core to be able to to serve 
you know, the potential sort of operating excellence of our organisations is immense. If we can stitch that together, drive performance for EBIT, we will win every day. But then the thing that's just, um, I think, super exciting is that we're at, when you're at that scale, you're incubating new capabilities that become these accelerators for your organisation and push you towards innovation, experimentation, that then take your organisation to that next height. And so, yeah, I think this is, this is a huge future um, and it will attract the best talent in the world. It's very exciting. Uh, I have a slightly different view. I, I did a study earlier this year of about 40 GBS organizations to look at diversity. And um, does a GBS organization have the ability to be a beacon of light in the organization? I think the, the willingness is there, but when I look at the work, the, the diversity complement within a GBS organization, it's not there yet. There's a challenge at um, one minus, two minus roles that are not yet diverse enough. And if a GBS organization really wants to influence the rest of the organization, it's going to have to place some bets about more diverse talent that it hasn't been perhaps as comfortable doing as it, it should be. But I think there's a long way to go before. Um, and it's not, I'm not just saying that because I occasionally have been known to wear a skirt. I think that there's, there's a long way to go in, in terms of diversity. It's gotten a lot better, but it's not, not diverse enough from a, from a um, gender standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, from a racial standpoint, and even from a geographic standpoint. Because one of the things I've seen is that the leadership tend to be in Western countries. And we've got a huge amount of talent, as you know, in India and Eastern Europe. The leadership is not coming from those locations. So we've, we've got some ways to go. Richard, where do you stand? So I suppose a slightly different perspective because you're know, entirely UK uh, based and, and we'd need to be uh, going forward. But I think on the wider points, uh, I think with innovation it is really key. I think we have to do more to kind of show and tell what the art of the possible is. And I think sometimes we'll be doing some quite interesting innovation, but no one will know about it. So I think that's one of my challenges, certainly, that we need to be uh, much more vocal about demonstrating what we can do. And at risk of a shameless plug, my team are up for one of the awards later for automation, so uh, fingers crossed for them. <laughs> okay, so we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I, think, I think it's an incredible opportunity for GBS organizations. Clearly, we need to address the, the diversity. Coming back again to leadership, what are some of the pitfalls that GBS leaders kind of in the audience need to look out for as they kind of take on this kind of brave new role of really driving and working within the enterprise to address and live in this world of change? For me, the biggest one is uh, know-it-all symptom or syndrome, which means we have so much of expertise in average tenure of a person sitting in this room uh, from experience perspective could be 10 to 20 years in GBS and we think we know it, and, and, and that's becoming a problem because we also hire a lot of leaders, we get leaders, and people believe they know already what, what needs to be done and they blame it to the culture of the organization that it's not ready. Whereas the problem is in the agility on the both the sides, right? Can we learn the company culture and then operate in that to make the change? So uh, I think the skill set itself is becoming a little bit of an issue because people are getting to, uh, let's say, close down a little bit from a learning perspective. So I think that's, that's the biggest thing for me to watch out for. When, when you're setting up a GBS or you're joining an organization, give enough time to learn about the organization culture, understanding it before start implementing a change or making things happen there. Got it. Quick pause. Yep, uh, really proud that we are gender balanced. We are racially balanced and we are expat to locally balanced, so come work for BHP. Um, Does that apply? <laughs> <laughs> the, probably the challenge is the, um, I think, and personally my own challenge is the balance between push and pull. We've got great mandates, we can leverage them to accelerate and grow and scale, that's the push, but equally you've got to be able to show value, outcomes, connect with your customer and their demand. Um, and then drag the pull, give them solutions. Um, and you've got to find that right balance um, to drive your organization forward. And that's, a, again, a tension that's always hard. Got it. Richard, I'm going to come back to you later. 
pitfalls? Yeah, I, I think just don't fall into the trap of being defensive. You know, quite often uh, in the world of GBS, your stakeholders often only want to see you when something's gone wrong. So uh, don't fall into the trap of being defensive on those occasions, but also therefore find the occasions you can talk more proactively about the things that you are doing. Are you optimistic, uh, Deborah, or not? Yeah, well, I'm optimistic, but I think there are three things that, that three pitfalls. Number one, it, as you say, aligning with the business. I think that's pretty critical. Make a decision, people. There are too many GBSs out there where leadership doesn't make a decision. They wait to see what's going to happen. Make a decision. You may be wrong. Take the risk. And, and the, probably the third thing is my biggest concern about this industry right now is because GBS is now more embedded in the org chart than it used to be. It's more accepted. A lot of the risk takers are, the, are, are aging out of the business. As soon as you can see a career path, the natural inclination is to take less risk. GBS is about taking risk. People who take risks know that there's an upside and there's a downside. But the early days of this industry, when it was in formation, was populated by risk takers who really brought us to where we are today. The next evolutions are going to come from risk takers too. There is a career outside of the organization people are in. There's a great nomadic opportunity right now, but we need people in this industry who are willing to take a risk. That's awesome. So um, with that, uh, round of applause for my uh, esteemed panel.